Hello everyone, Phil here from the Blue Envelope channel. In this video, we'll pick up where we left off talking about Jehovah's Witnesses in the Western New York area. I hope you enjoy it. Another interesting thing for witnesses in Jamestown is the Robert Jackson Center. So Robert H. Jackson, he was a Supreme Court Justice that came from Jamestown and he was the one that ruled on the flag salute case that the witnesses won. So he became an attorney. He was solicitor general and then attorney general for the federal government. Uh, and then in 1941, he was appointed to the Supreme Court and he stayed there until his death in 1954. Um, actually, if you look at it, his life timeline parallels pretty closely that of Nathan H. Knorr as far as growing up and, you know, achieving success in life. Another notable thing he did was uh, he was the chief prosecutor at the Nuremberg Trials in 1946. On the Supreme Court, he was involved in a number of notable cases, particularly Brown versus Board of Education, which overturned school segregation. But I think for witnesses, he's definitely best known for writing the majority opinion on the West Virginia State Board of Education versus Barnett case in 1943 which is when witnesses won the right not to have to salute the flag in school. That was the one that overturned the Gobitis decision from 1940, which is the Supreme Court case that the witnesses lost. And that's when they started getting all that mob violence against the witnesses, against um, kingdom halls and people getting lynched and halls burned down and all that stuff. It was that those few years in between those two decisions when witnesses started the kingdom schools so basically like parochial schools for witness kids because they were all expelled from school you know based on that supreme court decision incidentally how did i never know as a witness kid that when those cases were going on the flag salute in america was actually the same as the nazi salute with your arms stretched out in front of you it was called the bellamy salute and so that's what witness kids were supposed to be doing. In fact, it was only after the Americans saw that the fascists in Italy and the Nazis in Germany, they were doing their salute the same way. And that's at the, when America changed the flag salute to hand over your heart. Uh, that kicked in in 1943. A little random trivia there. So this Barnett decision is really eloquently written. It's really impressive to read the language there. <laughs> when you put that uh, language up against, you know, an article in the Watchtower magazine today. I mean, I don't know if you want to laugh or cry. It's so, it, there's such a stark difference there. But the interesting thing is that uh, Jackson was actually uh, almost the last choice for a justice to write the majority, majority decision. So witnesses really revere Jackson today, you know, for that decision he wrote. But if you dive more into it, in the Gobitis case in 1940, it had been an eight to one decision against the witnesses. And so Harlan Stone was the one justice dissenting and he was in favor of the witnesses. Now, three years later, by the time of the Barnett case, Harlan Stone had become the chief justice on the Supreme Court. And so you can just imagine for him, it would have really been like sweet revenge to write the decision you know, proving that he was right those years earlier. So he was certainly pro for the witnesses in this regard. And then there were actually four other justices that, there were three justices that were there from the original decision, and they had publicly said, came out and said they had changed their mind if they, and you know, would vote differently now. So they were vocal. And then there was one other new guy, I think uh, his name was Wiley Rutledge, and he had also said that he thought that decision was wrong. So there were five justices that were really vocal about their, their stance, but Justice Stone felt that for this majority to hold together, um, this it was a 6-3 vote for the witnesses. He felt that Jackson should actually be the one to write the decision, even though he by far was like the least, seemed to be the least invested in it or seemed to not care as much as the other ones about the witness stance, but like for political reasons, Harlan Stone had Robert Jackson write the decision. And I mean, he obviously did a ter terrific job in uh, writing it. 
There's some really iconic quotes from that text. So just to say, if you want some more information on this um, subject, I would recommend the book called Judging Jehovah's Witnesses by Sean Francis Peters. He's a college professor and he's written several books about small religious groups. So this book he wrote covers that JW period from about say 1935 to 1945. So it's this period when they were up in the Supreme Court almost constantly arguing cases. And then simultaneously they were getting heavy um, mob violence in the US from the public. So I remember reading it as a witness. I dug it out, I got an interlibrary loan. And uh, it's a pretty interesting book. I mean, I think I can recommend it both, you know, if you're a witness or if you're an ex-witness. It's a very balanced book. It's not like pro-JW or anti-JW. It's just kind of reporting events in the U.S. back in that time period. If you want a little shorter discussion of the Barnett case, I can also recommend something because in 2006, there was an event at the Jackson Center in Jamestown, and it was sort of an event commemorating his Barnett decision that he wrote. So there's a transcript of that event, which lasted a couple hours. So I'll link that below. I tell you what, that 2006 event meeting, that was a super big deal for, for witnesses in my area. Like any witness that could possibly get the day off went to attend that. So there was, I mean, hundreds of witnesses. Basically, the audience was all witnesses. And so the two Barnett girls from the original case were there. And so they were kind of interviewed in this roundtable discussion. Um, Harlan Stone's law clerk was there, and then Sean Francis Peters, who wrote that book. So it was a really cool event, I remember. I went, um, it was on one of the C-SPAN channels at the time, so that was cool. Now in 2018, that was the 75th anniversary of that Barnett decision, and so the Jackson Center kind of revisited the subject. And so they had another sort of event, roundtable discussion. Again, there were members of the Gobitis and the Barnett families that were there. One new thing in 2018, there was a talk or a presentation given by Philip Brumley, who's one of the main Watchtower attorneys nowadays. So this, that event is all up on YouTube. So I'll put a link to that if you want to watch it and check out a Watchtower attorney live and in person. You can <laughs> take a look at that. All right, so another interesting witness connection to the Jamestown area was that in 1910, there was a convention of Bible students held there. So they kind of had one main convention every year somewhere. In 1910 was in Jamestown, or more specifically in Celeron, where Lucille Ball was from, which is basically, nowadays, it's in Jamestown. So just to explain, from the period around 1900 to maybe the late 20s, there were these places called trolley parks. Um, basically, the idea was that all the cities, before cars got real popular, all the cities had trolley lines. And so the trolley companies, which were privately held, would build these amusement parks at the end of the line. And basically, it would be a reason so that people would buy trolley tickets on the weekends. So Coney Island was maybe the most famous example of a trolley park. But there were hundreds of them all over the country after a while. And so one, one of them was built in Celeron, New York, right on Chautauqua Lake. It opened in 1893. It actually lasted until about 1960, although once cars started getting more popular, uh, the trolley parks kind of started dying out. The main trouble from what I was reading in Celeron was that buildings kept burning down every few years, which is understandable because everything was wooden structures at that point. The Celeron Amusement Park was on the trolley line there, and then Chautauqua Lake also had steamboats that would run in the warm weather all up and down the lake, and there were docks, you know, where it would stop for amusement parks, regular parks, the towns along the lake. So that was a big thing in the summertime. So I found a website that had some pictures of the amusement park where the convention was held back in the day. Um, so these are actually postcards. There weren't many actual photographs from back then. Or maybe these are photographs. They're just colorized. But it kind of gives you an idea of what was there when the Bible students were meeting. You see there's a Ferris wheel there. There's a lot of pictures. I'll kind of scroll through them quickly, but you can pause the video if you want to check anything out. But here, yeah, so this is actually one from the convention. It says Baptism in Chautauqua Lake. 
So you can see there, um, there were two baptisms held during the convention. And you can kind of see off to the right side, there's like that tube, that slide coming down. So that was a toboggan slide there, and uh, that's where the baptism was held. Here we see more of a bird's eye view. You can see the docks and or the piers and the Ferris wheel. This is one of the theaters that was there. I'm not sure which one the Bible students met in. Another view of the theater, the interior. Here is a ballroom there. Here's another auditorium there at the park. You see kind of that Moorish architectural influence. That was in the period when the Shriners were real popular. Here's some pictures of the trolley cars that would run out from the center of town to sell around. Actually a double-decker trolley car, which is cool. There's one of the bandstands there. Yep, they had a roller coaster there eventually. There's a picture of the toboggan slides that people could slide down. Boathouse. Looks like a pretty nice spot to hold a convention, I mean. Yeah, so here's an article from the Watchtower from, uh, I think this was July 1st, 1910, so just before the convention, and it's talking about what would go on there. In the second paragraph, it says, uh, it says, we anticipate that the friends will have no particular interest in the amusements. Anyway, these are less patronized in the daytime, and our proposition is to hold the convention sessions in daylight only, 9 to 5, with an intermission at noon for a plain lunch. So yeah, it just talks about um, the getting the train to Chautauqua, to Jamestown. And just like nowadays, they wanted everybody to get their accommodations through the society. From what they're saying, there weren't enough hotel rooms in the area to manage all the witnesses, all the students. They were, they got about 4,500 Bible students that came. And so basically there were Bible students that went a few weeks earlier to Jamestown and uh, they just kind of went door to door and asked people if they would rent a room for the nine days to Bible students. And that's kind of how they got rooms for everybody. And then once you showed up, they would assign you to a room based on how much you wanted to pay. So I'm going to switch now to a, a souvenir book that the society printed. I guess I never heard of these before, but evidently in those days, each year at the end of the year, they would print out the souvenir book that Bible students could buy, which had each, it would kind of cover all the conventions that had been held for the entire year, and it would have talk transcripts and then pictures of uh, the speakers and whatnot. So it's kind of a souvenir thing that you could get in those days. So yeah, I'll just kind of run through the um, the book there. So this is the cover. 1910. I'll put a link in. There was a website I found which had a whole bunch of years for these books, but they look pretty cool, actually. I could definitely see why you'd want to get one back then. This is kind of all the Brooklyn elders, I guess. You see Russell at the top there, Rutherford at the bottom. So remember, they had just moved from Pittsburgh to Brooklyn kind of the previous year. So yeah, this basically covers all of Russell's travels in 2010, and it kind of gives talks, like talk transcripts of wherever he was. So one trip he took to England here. And it kind of jumped out at me. It mentioned Chautauqua here on the left side. When he came for the one talk, 
It says the friends decided to adopt the American form of greeting, and so the chairman announced that as Brother Russell came to the platform, they should arise and give him the Chautauqua salute. So it talks about Chautauqua Institution there, and at the end of the next paragraph it says, it was there that this Chautauqua salute was instituted. The congregation arising and waving their handkerchiefs to the speaker, he responding in a similar manner. The truth friends have improved upon this by singing at the same time. So that was kind of a thing that Russell would do, evidently. And actually, if you look in the publications, it sort of continued on with the subsequent Watchtower presidents. So if you look in the 75 yearbook, it's talking about the 1941 convention in St. Louis, and it's talking about when the children book was released, so all the kids were sitting in front of the stage there. It says, uh, as Brother Rutherford stepped on the platform, the youngsters cheered and clapped. He waved his handkerchief, and thousands of young hands waved back. Soon he strode to the front of the platform, literally beaming at the sight. So Rutherford did the Chautauqua wave, and then if you look in the 56 Watchtowers, talking about that, that big 1955 convention they had in Nuremberg, Germany, it says, As Brother Nor was about to leave the lofty platform separated by broad, the broad Kingdom Street from his audience, he waved his handkerchief. Response was immediate. The whole throng changed to what appeared as one big mass of waving white flowers. And that was the last reference I saw to the Chautauqua salute. So maybe it kind of died out with uh, Nathan Knorr there. So just kind of skipping forward, here's a picture, some pictures from the Chautauqua Convention. You can see the auditorium there with those Moorish towers. And then it shows the inside. Three newsboys. I'm not sure what that means. The one newsboy looks, <laughs> he's got a pretty good white beard going on. Commissary. All right, and then we get to the Chautauqua Lake Convention. So this is where that starts. And it's talking again about all the trains you could take to get there. It's kind of funny on the right side. It mentions, it says, the Erie Railroad has a history and plays an important part in the fulfillment of the prophecy of Daniel, 12th chapter. So the trains were how people were running to and fro in the last days. So here we see kind of the main speakers at the convention there. So we get to the opening of the convention. Um, it mentions, uh, actually the convention started with a speech by the mayor of Jamestown. So he talks about how glad he is to have the Bible students there. <laughs> he says, I feel deeply interested in this movement, although I do not understand much about it. But so he said, welcome to the area. And then Russell gave his speech uh, about the convention. So he talks about this arrangement. He, he says basically in earlier conventions, which were smaller, that he could kind of meet with everybody. And in this one, he says there's too many people to do that. So instead, what they set up was uh, each, everybody could get a ticket to go visit Russell. So there were, each day, 500 people could go um, take a steamboat up to his hotel. So the convention was in Celeron, so in Jamestown at the one end of the lake, and then Russell was staying at a hotel up in Mayville, which is the other end of the lake. So the 500 each day would get on a boat, which would sail up, took about an hour and 45 minutes, sail up to Mayville, and then there was kind of a reception with Charles Russell, so he would give a little talk, and then the coal porters, the pioneers, would serve everybody ice cream each night. And then the next night, another 500 people would go. And so basically by the end of the week, almost everybody could get to meet old Charlie Russell up there. So Russell, so these, these are pretty interesting um, articles to read because these aren't like articles like the Watchtower does nowadays where they're edited afterwards. These are like actual transcripts of what Russell was saying. So there's kind of... They're actually more interesting to read because there's kind of little funny twists and turns now and then. So in that last paragraph there, he says, uh, talking about the convention, he says, of course, like everything perfect, it is imperfect. Or like everything human, it's imperfect. You'll probably not have it as nice as you will when you get to heaven. 
But uh, he says, you know, just report if anything's wrong. And then he has this really odd statement. He says, it has been reported that we are all colored people. I hope we have the proper color. By this, I do not mean to say anything discouraging to our colored friends who are with us. We recognize all those who are the Lord's without respect to nationality or color. We love all those who love him. So I don't know if he was trying to make a joke there or it's kind of an odd statement. Here we see a picture of the um, foreign representatives at the convention. So these are basically all the branch overseers that traveled to America to attend. So you can see there um, Denmark, Sweden, Scotland, London, and Norway. So notice in particular the fellow in the center, Dr. John Edgar. So we'll come back to him later. And then the bottom left, John Hemery, the branch overseer in England. We'll mention him too. So here we have a discourse on the subject of heart circumcision. So I was curious if they would have anything about literal circumcision. And sure enough, there was an interesting statement near the end. Uh, he says, in the type, meaning like types and antitypes, he says, in the type, only the males were circumcised, only one sex. So in the antitype, even now, all the circumcised are of one sex. Therefore, the new creation are now sexless, and the human creation will be at the end of the millennium. So I guess you could take that two ways, either sexless, like nobody's having sex, like the Russells, but I think he meant more that everybody would be a single gender by the end of the millennium, which is a statement, you know, you see in other Watchtower literature at that time. So here's a little blurb from the Jamestown Journal. So they would kind of reprint any articles in the newspaper about the convention. So this just, I thought it was interesting because it mentioned what the lunches were each day. So on the right side there, it says there were buns, pressed meat of various kinds, uh, milk, cakes, lemonade, cheese, and bananas. 25 barrels of bananas each day. So that's what you would get at the convention. So we see here just some pictures of the um, convention there. So you see the baptism happening. So it's kind of an odd setup. You can see there like people, other tourists would be in their boats and they, would just, <laughs> they were just hanging out watching the baptism. I guess that was a novelty in that time. And the one, uh, I did see a reference that on the one toboggan slide there on the right that uh, Charles Russell was one of the fellows up there, but it's kind of hard to tell in these postcards now. And then there's the steamboat they would take up the lake to visit Russell. There's Russell's hotel in Mayville. And then there's a picture of the reception they would have each evening. So here's a little blurb about the first baptism on Tuesday, and it mentions 242 men and women got baptized. So here we see a uh, pilgrim question meeting. So the pilgrims were the circuit overseers back then. So Russell met with all the pilgrims, and it was kind of like a question and answer session where they would raise questions that had come up. So I noticed one question in particular it said, should we consider it necessary to call attention to other prominent dates than 1874, 1878, 1881, or 1914? Should 1911 be included? And you notice Russell's answer. He says, I'm glad that question is there, my dear brothers and sisters. You will notice that in my own teachings and writings, I am careful to avoid any other dates than these. I know nothing about other dates. So it's just kind of funny, the prominent dates you see there, and, and then you think about the prominent dates for witnesses nowadays, they're all gone except for good old 1914. So not so prominent anymore. All right, on page 217, we get to an interesting section about uh, the late Dr. John Edgar. So as we saw from that picture earlier, um, he was sort of the main witness in Glasgow, Scotland, I'm not sure if I'm not sure that there was a branch in Scotland, but John Edgar was sort of the main Bible student running things in the country there. So he had um, died. He was supposed to be one of the main speakers at the convention, but he died in June, a month or so earlier. 
And so instead of the talk transcript that he would have given, they run this article about, um, it's a memoir by his sister. And basically it's, it covers, it does cover his history as a Bible student, but mainly it's about him dying, unfortunately. It's about the last four days of his life. It's kind of funny in that little obituary intro, it says, he died like a true saint should die. So I'm not really sure what they meant by that because he uh, he had appendicitis, so it ended up that his appendix ruptured and he died from sepsis. And it took like four days. It sounds very painful. This article goes into great detail. So I'm not sure what they mean by that's how a saint should die, if it just means how stoic he was with all the suffering. But um, it's kind of a sad article, to be honest. So yeah, basically he had some family that had become Bible students, and then they introduced him to uh, Russell's books, The Studies in the Scriptures. And so he became a Bible student. He got really active. Um, so you can see there on the left side, it says uh, he was a lecturer in, the, in Britain there in the UK. And then it says in the summer of 1906, he and his wife in company with myself visited many of the principal cities in the States and in Canada. And you can see it kind of had, he sort of had like some main talks that he would give to the Bible students. So you see in the last sentence, it mentions principally on the various features of the time prophecies and on the symbolisms of the Great Pyramid. And then it says in 1907, his well-known lecture, Where Are the Dead, was delivered several times in Glasgow to crowded audiences. So that was kind of a main talk he gave, Where Are the Dead? And so the society actually turned that talk into a booklet by the same name. So basically he they took his his words um, and made a booklet where are the dead. And as you if you search that in the Watchtower Library, that was a very popular booklet. It was used all over the world with folks. It's interesting that booklet that John Edgar wrote was actually the first contact that Fred Franz had with the Bible students. So he got that booklet in 1913, and that's what really started his whole joining the Bible students. And then Fred Franz gave Nathan Norris baptism talk in 1923, and they got to be close friends. So it's kind of funny how like everything, you can trace it back to John Edgar's booklet here. So on the next page, it's talking now more about his last few days alive. And so his family and, and various Bible students from then were coming to visit, you know, say goodbye to him. So you notice there at the bottom left, it says about 4 p.m. a message came from John that he would like Brother Hemery and one of his sisters to come to him. It was arranged that I should accompany Brother Hemery. It was most touching to witness the greeting of these two brothers in the Lord. The doctor asked Brother Hemery to give him a long kiss and the tears sprang to Brother Hemery's eyes as he caught hold of John's hand and exclaimed, My dearest brother, you know you are my dearest brother. The doctor smiled and replied, You know I love you, though I may not always have manifested it as much as I should have done, Scotch fashion, you know, which I am trying to overcome. Haltingly he spoke, sickness frequently disturbing him, but with determination, he continued till he said all he had to say. So isn't this an interesting little anecdote? I mean, maybe I'm reading it too much into it from my 2020, you know, mind about the relationship between these two brothers. I don't know. Brother Hemery, he was the um, branch overseer in England in 1899, Russell had appointed John Hemery to be the first pilgrim or circuit overseer in Britain. And then in 1901, he appointed him the branch overseer of the Watchtower offices in London. That branch had just opened the year before in 1900. So John Hemery was a very high profile British Bible student. So basically, you know, the Watchtower Society dedicated six pages here to Dr. John Edgar. Uh, he was a very beloved Bible student um, by Charles Russell and by all the students at that time. In fact, if you look in the Proclaimers book, 
um, Russell had developed that list of who should be on the editorial committee to run the society after he died. And John Edgar was on the, the B list along right next to Rutherford. If anybody on the main list couldn't do it for whatever reason. So very high profile Bible student. However, it's so interesting that by the Noor generation of the Watchtower Society in the 50s, the history was completely rewritten about Dr. Edgar. So if you look in the 1956 Watchtower 515, check out, this was an article about the Great Pyramid of Giza. It says, because none of these theories fully and satisfactorily explain the purpose of building the Great Pyramid, others have developed a hypothesis that it was built under divine inspiration, that perhaps Melchizedek was a builder, and that God provided it as a witness in stone to corroborate the Bible. Such men as John Taylor of London, Professor Smith, and Dr. Edgar of Scotland advocated the theory that the measurements of the Great Pyramid, and particularly the measurements of its internal passageways and chambers, were full of scriptural meaning. And then there's a footnote, which all it says is, Bible students also held to this thought prior to 1928. So from, from this article, would you ever in a thousand years guess that Dr. Edgar of Scotland was a Bible student? And not just a Bible student, but one of the main Bible students in Russell's time. I mean, you would never, ever, ever guess that. So who are the other two guys here mentioned? Well, John Taylor, he was the one that had actually really kicked off interest in pyramidology. So he had published a book about it in 1859, and he's the one that invented this idea of pyramid inches that Russell always talked about. Uh, professor Smith was Professor Charles Piazzi Smith. He was a British astronomer, and he read Taylor's book, and he got super excited about, about it. And he ended up mounting an expedition to Egypt to study and measure the Great Pyramid. And then he published his findings in a book in 1864. And it was that book by Professor Smith, all the diagrams of the passages and tunnels and measurements in the pyramid. That's what Russell used in so many Watchtower publications. You can find diagrams and all kinds of, uh, you know, stuff about the pyramid there. So it wasn't that John Edgar was a pyramidologist on his own. He had learned about pyramidology from the Watchtower Society and from Charles Russell. So if you look at the studies in the scriptures books that Russell published, his very first one was in 1886, The Divine Plan of the Ages. And it, just as you look at the cover there, there's a diagram. Oh, yeah. The divine plan is shown in the Great Pyramid. And so... That, co that cover diagram is one of Professor Smith's diagrams from his book about pyramids. So right off the bat, this is the first studies in the scriptures, and it is heavy into pyramids. So there's the chart there. If you look at the very first page, it says, The divine plan of the ages and the corroborative testimony of the great pyramid in Egypt God's stone witness and prophet. If you go to the table of contents, boom, very first thing, the Great Pyramid, study one, the testimony of God's stone witness and prophet, the Great Pyramid in Egypt. So, I mean, if you wanted to be a Bible student, that was day number one, studying pyramidology. And then we come to this preface here um, that Russell included, and check out who wrote the preface, Professor Charles Piazzi Smith, the ex-astronomer royal for Scotland. So basically, Russell wrote the book, and then he sent it off to Professor Smith to see if he had gotten everything right about the pyramid. And uh, you can see the letter there from Smith. He said, yep, you did a great job. And then Russell was so pleased about that letter that he published it at the beginning of his uh, book. So this is just one of the saddest things about this video, I think, is learning about how John Edgar was like a key Bible student back in the day, and yet the Watchtower Society completely kind of threw him under the bus. They erased him, you know, from Watchtower history. I can't imagine how bad, you know, his family would feel. I don't know if they stuck with the Bible students or not and became witnesses, but how bad they would feel to read 
how he was described later in Watchtower history. Just to confirm how much esteem he was in, this was a talk later during the convention, and uh, you notice on the right side there it says, and now as emphasizing the importance of the vow, we would like to quote you the words narrated in one of the late issues of the Watchtower, setting forth the dying words of our beloved brother, Dr. Edgar of Scotland. He was a very dear brother to many of us who were personally acquainted with him. We believe he is now with the Lord. We believe it would be well for us all to remind ourselves of his last words of love and interest for all the Lord's people. And then if you look at the last page of this tourist book that the society printed, you can see other things that you could buy. Um, and so you notice there in the middle, you could order a book by John Edgar called Great Pyramid Passages. So you could get that from his brother, Morton Edgar, right from Scotland. So again, a very, you know, integral part of the Watchtower Society at that time. So later in the week, there was a discourse by this brother Rockwell, and his theme was, don't give up the ship. Now, if anybody's from Erie, Pennsylvania, that phrase will immediately be super familiar to you um, because you can walk into any gift shop in Erie and you'll see t-shirts and coffee mugs and book bags with that phrase all over the place. It comes from, uh, it was during the War of 1812, so that was kind of largely on the, fought on the Great Lakes, and there were these naval battles between England and America. So there was this one sea captain, uh, James Lawrence, and he died in one of the battles, and so one of the, his final words to his crew were said to have been, don't give up the ship. Well, Captain Lawrence had this friend, Captain Perry, who has the awesome name Oliver Hazard Perry. So when Captain Perry found out, he adopted those words as like his motto. And so he had a flag sewn up in Erie with those words on it. Don't give up the ship. He put it on his uh, flagship, which became the USS Niagara, was his main ship. And he was super successful in battle. He basically won all the battles and took over the Great Lakes and helped uh, win the War of 1812 for America. His uh, flagship, the USS Niagara, was later, uh, much later, was fully restored to its original condition. And so it docks in Erie when it's not sailing. So it parks right next to the library. And this was maybe only five minutes from my house in Erie. So you could see it down there all the time. But then in the warm weather, the Niagara is sailing out all over on the East Coast uh, with other tall ships for different events and whatnot. So anyways, Brother Rockwell knew this history evidently. And so he talked all about this theme of uh, don't give up the ship. So we can see here he explains right near the end of his talk about the naval history of this battle and this phrase. And basically his point in his talk was, you know, the organization has some problems and some people are leaving. That's kind of a theme you, I saw reading through all these talks is evidently a, a fair number of people were leaving in the previous year or two. And he says, you know, don't give up the ship. Stick with the organization right or wrong and things will work out well in the end. So kind of a common sentiment still for uh, witnesses today. So later in the week, there was this meeting it was a special meeting for pilgrims, elders, and deacons. So basically, Brother Russell met with the circuit overseers, the elders, and the ministerial servants of the day. And we even see a picture here of the meeting. We see a lot of white men in this picture <laughs> that were heading up the organization. But anyways, one part of this uh, talk Brother Russell was giving, I caught my attention that he mentioned a uh, new light. And so that's a phrase, you know, you hear a lot these days, but as a witness, I never really heard that phrase, new light versus old light. And I'm, I'm not sure if it's really been used much by the society specifically, but here, uh, Charles Russell was using that phrase, new light. And so it's kind of interesting how he was using it. So he's talking about Satan tempting some of the brothers. He says, some he might tempt to go off onto some side issue that was new so that the class, the congregation, might think they were getting new light. 
I do not think you want any new light. I do not think the Lord wants any new light. I do not think there is any new light, my dear friends. Our great light was started 1,800 years ago. And down a little later, he says, Hence, we should avoid anything like trying to manufacture some new light, dangerous to ourselves and dangerous to the flock. He's kind of making this interesting point that uh, I think what he's saying is, you know, new light from headquarters, from the society, is cool, but coming up with new thoughts on your own and that sort of new light, that is bad news. Don't do it. Stick to what we tell you. So that was Charles Russell's take on new light. Later on in the week, there was a meeting with all the coal porters, all the pioneers of the day. And uh, so I thought there was one interesting point. The brother is talking, he's basically kind of talking about what your presentation should be or the best presentation to have to move the most books. So you notice he says, the next thing, the Bible and Track Society is promulgating a new method of Bible study, which is commanding a great deal of attention among all thoughtful Protestants, is what they could say. And then he explains, he says, at one time we left out the words Allegheny and Pittsburgh because we made that city a very bad reputation. And as a result, we had to drop those words. No good thing could come out of Nazareth, you know. Now that our headquarters are changed to Brooklyn, you can use either one of those terms. We can say Bible and Tract Society of Brooklyn or Bible and Tract Society of New York. He says uh, either of those expressions would be good to add because Brooklyn or New York has a reputation of being a Bible center as a great many Bible societies are located there. So that's a pretty interesting little uh, paragraph, right? He, he says we, we couldn't mention Allegheny and Pittsburgh because we made that city a very bad reputation and we had to leave out that. So, and I guess he's probably referring to, you know, all the, the, the uh, divorce proceedings with the Russells there. And so evidently in the end, the Bible students didn't have too hot of a reputation in Pittsburgh. And so it worked out kind of well that they up and moved their headquarters to Brooklyn. So I just thought that was kind of interesting. Now, right at the end of the Pioneer meeting, Brother Russell came back and made some concluding remarks. And it's, his remarks were actually about heart bookmarks. So basically what he's saying, you can read the paragraph there, but they were some of the coal porters had these little celluloid heart bookmarks. Uh, I wish I had a picture to know what they were talking about, but... Evidently, they really liked him, and one of the coal porters said, you know, if I could give out one of these bookmarks free with the books, the studies in the scriptures, I think I could sell more books. And Brother Russell says, you know, that is a pretty sweet idea. And so basically he's saying, guys, as many books as you order, just write that you want the, the heart bookmarks with them, and we'll send them to you for free. So you, And then you can tell the householder, hey, if you buy these books, I'm going to throw in a free heart bookmark. And evidently, <laughs> they thought that would move more books. So on the final Sunday, they had a second baptism. It mentions here that 212 got baptized on the second day, the second session, again, near the toboggan slides. So at the end of the very... At the very end of the convention, they had a love feast, which was a thing that the Bible students did at that time. And so basically, they would have cut up bread on trays. And then, so it says the pilgrims had that. So all the circuit overseers had these trays of bread. And then as they would stand in their spots, the all the Bible students would walk by them. And they would take a piece of bread and shake their hands, and in other places it mentions they would be singing as they did this uh, ritual thing. I don't know what the word would be. And that's how they would kind of wind up their assemblies. So they had their little love feast here. So right at the very last page of the this um, book that uh, the society sold, you can see other stuff that was available for sale. So it says you could buy more copies of this book for a buck a piece. 
You could also, they reprinted some of the 1909 ones that you could buy. You could get some song uh, sheets here. You could get a pack of cards that had scriptures on them, so they would help you memorize scriptures. You get that pyramid book that we talked about. And finally, you could get um, photographs of the uh, convention there in, on Chautauqua Lake. So uh, again, you could get like a big picture or get one of those panoramic pictures of all the attendees there. So that's about all the information about uh, the history of uh, religion and especially the Bible students and witnesses in Western New York. I hope maybe you found it kind of interesting. And uh, so thanks for watching. Leave a comment below. Subscribe if you'd like to for more such videos. And hey, thanks for watching. Take care.